hitmen, who built their own hitmobile so they could shoot people from the back of a moving car. Amongst many other atrocities this pair committed was one in which they forced the head of Billy McCarthy into a vice and squeezed until his eyeball popped out. An incident which a certain American film director felt was so entertaining, he included it in one of his movies. What most people have failed to realise, however, is that in most cases, the Mafia chieftains who actually ran organised crime did not approve, generally speaking, of these acts of gross brutality. Not that they gave a damn about morals, but the cleverest amongst them, like Paul the Waiter Rica, realised that sensationalised events like the St Valentine's Day Massacre produced public outrage and a crackdown on their illegal activities. Rico realised that the effectiveness of mobsters like Diamond Joe Esposito came from keeping a low profile. And it was the Mafia bosses who learned this lesson best, Santos Traficante and Sam Giancana in particular, who in later years became the most successful. Even today, few Americans appreciate the extent to which their country was being controlled by organised crime in the 1930s. The mob were in total control of Hollywood because all the union labour needed to make films, carpenters, set construction, catering, they were all under the control of the mob. In particular, the control of the Teamsters Union, the drivers and haulage people who made essential deliveries to absolutely everyone meant that virtually all American business was caught in the web of Mafia racketeering. Studio bosses like Harry Cohn, Louis B. Mayer and the Warner Brothers knew they had to play along to get anything done at all. The big studio heads, like all rich businessmen, found they were forced to become friends with Mafia dons. And the individual who exploited this situation most effectively was a gangster few people have ever heard of. Murray the Camel... Humphreys. Generally speaking, the ethnically Italian gangsters of this period were coarse, brutal and most importantly ignorant men. They had no education. They couldn't hold an intelligent conversation because they'd spent no time in school. Don Colleon, I am honoured and grateful that you have invited me to your daughter's wedding. on the day of your daughter's wedding. This made doing business with refined and sophisticated entrepreneurs difficult, not to say embarrassing. And Sam Giancana was quick to spot this. So whenever a business deal needed to be made by someone with style and sophistication, he would send along his silver-tongued Welshman, Murray the Camel, so called because he was known for being sartorial and for cutting a dash in expensive camel hair coats. Humphreys became a crucial figure during the pre-war period because his contact with the luminaries of Hollywood meant he received invitations from senior politicians who wanted to rub shoulders with stars like Clark Gable, George Raft, Cary Grant, Gary Cooper, Marilyn Monroe and Frank Sinatra, all of whom were mafia controlled and used by the mob as bagmen, moving colossal sums of money around the country because Giancana cynically realised the authorities were too starstruck to ever check their luggage. He even used a priest for the same purpose, who he referred to as Father Cash. And just as the priest was happy to take his percentage, so the politicians, who Giancana always maintained were the easiest to corrupt, were happy to do the same. In Esposito's time, he had boasted of buying votes for Calvin Coolidge. By the time of World War II, Sam Giancana was boasting to his younger brother, we own the White House. He was adamant that every state governor, congressman and senior judge in the country was on the take, and the mob's most spectacular success, as they sought control over all the big players, was their corrupting of FBI director J. Edgar Hoover. It's become fairly widely known in recent years that Hoover was a transvestite homosexual. What is less well known is the elaborate scheme he dreamed up for accepting mafia bribes. What he used to do was to go to the $2 window at the racetrack where he was photographed many times by the press to give himself a clean, upstanding image. What the pressmen didn't know was that he always took along a crooked emissary who placed huge bets which ran into the thousands at another window 
on races which were fixed by the mob boss Frank Costello. By keeping Hoover supplied with millions in winnings and holding on to compromising photographs of the FBI chief having sex with his lover, Clyde Tolson, which several CIA agents claim they have seen, the Mafia had American law enforcement entirely under their control. So the question then is, what do you do with that kind of power? The answer is that when you're the American Mafia, you routinely wipe out what they call do-gooders. This is how organised crime has influenced American society for nearly a century. If a decent man becomes a rising star in politics and looks as if he might try to make a better life for ordinary people, they simply kill him as a matter of routine. And in the book they wrote together, Chuck and Sam Giancana Jr. are at pains to point out that a classic early case of this practice was the assassination of Anton Schermack. Schermack was a democratic politician who had tried to crack down on Al Capone's bootlegging operations. Many felt he would go on to become a great president himself until he was shot while on stage with FDR by Giuseppe Zangara. After the murder, Zangara claimed it was a political act and he ought to be entitled to clemency because he simply hated all rich people. But this was actually what he'd simply been told to say by the mob, who were using him as a fall guy. When he went to the electric chair, Sam Giancana turned to his brother and expressed his pleasure at how nice and neat the whole affair had been. And he further explained that choosing a patsy to wipe out a politician who was a do-gooder was something the Italian mafia had been doing forever. It was a practice as old as the Sicilian hills. And he was amazed at how the Mafia kept getting away with it, because you really would think people would catch on. This was 1935. You have a decent chief executive, murdered, in broad daylight, shot by a patsy, who was later killed himself by the authorities. Does this sound familiar? However, even in Shermack's time, the mob could not be said to be in complete control of American life. Because while they controlled the streets through their influence over politics and the justice system, they were not yet in control of the United States military or its mainstream media. Tragically, this all started to change with a series of events which began with the scuttling of the SS Normandy by a Manhattan-based Nazi agent. This was February the 9th, 1942. And having just joined the war, the United States was trying to keep its allies supplied with vital war material using convoys which were loaded on the waterfront and sailed almost every day out of New York Harbour. As everyone knows, many fell prey to the wolf packs of German U-boats and the Normandy had been designed for much greater speed specifically so that she could outrun them. When she fell to sabotage, it was a colossal blow to the Allied war effort and in response, a naval intelligence officer Anthony Marslow decided to enlist the help of the New York Mafia because he knew they were in control of all commercial activity on the docks. The subterfuge by foreign intelligence agents ceased, but the price America paid was calamitous because getting the Mafia's help meant getting permission from the boss of bosses, Lucky Lucanio. It is one of history's great ironies that the United States government went crawling to the Mafia for help at a moment when the mob themselves had just been severely weakened and could have been crushed altogether by an administration with enough political will. The notorious Lucanio had just started a 40-year prison sentence in Great Meadow Penitentiary, and most of his Sicilian gangsters back home were already behind bars, having been caught up in Mussolini's Mafia purge. Being himself Italian, Mussolini knew there was only one way to deal with the Mafia, and when he came to power, he ordered his iron prefect, Cesare More, to simply lock up all the Mafia families in Sicily, which wasn't exactly difficult because everybody knew who they were. Of course, after the Allied invasion of Sicily, Marsler then compounded his error by choosing Sicilian Americans like New York Mayor Charles Paletti and OSS officer Joseph Russo, whose father was born in Corleone, to head AMGOT, the Allied military government, whose job it was to restore community cohesion on the island. And of course, their way of doing this was not only to let all the mafiosi out of jail, they even made known mob bosses like Genco Russo and Don Calogero Vizzini into the heads of local government and gave them full civilian and military power 
over the island. So this was the accident of history through which the Mafia began its relationship with American military intelligence. It was a catastrophe for Italy, which has been ruled over by organised crime ever since. It was a catastrophe for Sicily, which suffered a brutal murder every three days in the post-war period. And it was a catastrophe for America, which saw many once vibrant communities, particularly in New Jersey, have the heart ripped out of them by Mafia extortion and drug dealing. Lucky Luciano was deported after being released from jail and having found a kindred spirit in another secret organisation, the newly created Central Intelligence Agency, he was then able to combine the activities of organised crime, particularly international drug running, with smuggling of American-made weapons. This unholy alliance gave the world its first ever pirates who flew aeroplanes. That's what these people became, pirates with aeroplanes. The CIA became the world's primary import-export of narcotics and used the colossal profits to fuel wars around the world, thereby enabling their friends in the military-industrial complex to sell yet more weapons. Under the disguise of liberal democracy, these men, who had financed Hitler, became the enemies of liberty and democracy on a planet-wide basis. And as if to underline their Nazi credentials, they also hired all of the former German Nazi intelligence officers, like Reinhard Galen, who were out of a job at the end of the war and brought them into the fold at the beginning of the Cold War, even though they were perfectly well aware that these men had committed genocide and should have been prosecuted as war criminals. Their attitude, quite clearly, was that as they had paid for Nazi Germany, they were entitled to pick over its carcass in any way they chose. This was yet another political catastrophe for the United States because these were the people who put together the notorious Operation Paperclip, which rounded up all of the Nazi rocket scientists, like Werner von Braun, and put them to work for their new American Nazi owners to give them, for the first time in human history, ICBMs with nuclear warheads. They became the first men ever to have the power to destroy the whole world at the touch of a button, and it was clear to many observers at the time that it all rather went to their heads. I can no longer sit back and allow Communist infiltration, communist indoctrination, communist subversion, and the international communist conspiracy to sap and impurify all of our precious bodily fluids. They saw themselves as giants who were looking down and laughing upon this planet of tiny fools who were stupid enough to go on and on killing each other while they have sold arms to both sides throughout the Second World War. Fock Wolf aeroplanes, which bombed American soldiers, were manufactured by it and Allied sailors were drowning in a freezing North Atlantic because their convoys were sunk by guns of Nazi battleships, which swivelled on American-made ball bearings. American soldiers were crushed under the wheels of tanks and trucks made by Henry Ford and John Rockefeller, and gassed to death by the same people. Sam Giancana took the trouble to explain how this cynical process worked by composing just one terse, simple sentence which his brother wrote down for posterity. People give their lives, he said, just so a few fat cats can make a killing. And this was precisely what Spedley Butler had tried to explain to the world with his book, War is Just a Racket. At the war's end, the rich elite found fortune continuing to smile on them. Firstly, they were able to control the utter farce of the Nuremberg Trials, which should have hanged every single American merchant banker and leading industrialist. As it was, their contribution to World War II remained hidden from public scrutiny, and they were even allowed to gerrymander light sentences for their German Nazi friends, like Jean Marchacht, who got off with just a few years and later retired as a billionaire. But best of all was that the one man who might have been a check to their power passed away as soon as the war was over. And with President Roosevelt gone, and their first Nazi glove puppet, Hitler, also deceased, it became necessary for Prescott Bush to find another young politician to sponsor. In true American fashion, he decided to advertise. 
He placed an ad in the LA Times which candidly explained that a group of rich businessmen were seeking a young, ambitious, immoral and most definitely malleable politician who might one day run for president. The ad was deliberately worded in this cynical way because they knew that only an evil, slimy and completely incorrigible little creep would ever dream of applying for the position. That was what they wanted and that was what they got in the shape of a certain Richard Nixon here being congratulated on his success by his new master, Prescott Bush. And not long after this picture was taken, in 1947, Nixon engaged the services of a Jewish gangster who was working for Sam Giancana called Jacob Rubenstein, a man whom the world would one day come to know as Jack Ruby. (laughs) Having bought themselves a new political puppet, this nefarious band of 20th century robber barons now took stock of their situation. The Hitler Project, as this Richard Eat called it, could hardly have turned out very much better. Their businesses had made colossal profits. Prescott had got his union bank back. The communist menace they so wanted to contain had almost sunk back in the Middle Ages with the ravages of war. And best of all was that they had now achieved the very world domination which Hitler had dreamed about. They knew that in this new age of modern telecommunications and high-speed jet travel, they had become the first group of robber barons in human history to dominate the entire globe because they realised there was now absolutely no one left who could stop them from doing whatever they wanted to do next. However, they also realised that bombed out and dilapidated Europe would not be able to bear another war for many decades. This was why they now decided that their obscene business profits could only keep coming in if they moved their game of phony war into the Third World. And this was how the CIA came to instigate conflict throughout the Middle East, Southeast Asia and Central America. Chuck Giancana well remembers a conversation which he had with his Mafia boss brother Sam during this period in which he questioned him with genuine anxiety about the communist menace spreading throughout the world. The TV news was painting a sinister picture of a Soviet enemy with millions of fifth columnists which was intent upon taking over the entire planet. Hadn't he heard of the domino theory and wasn't he worried about it? In response, Sam Giancana simply smiled at his kid brother's naivety and he asked him, didn't he realize that the United States, by which he meant the shadow government, not the official one, wanted to take over the world as well? And that the whole idea of communism was just the excuse they were using to do it? He told him that in China, they had already succeeded in getting a member of the Chinese mafia a brutal gangster called Mao Zedong, into power just so they could sell more cigarettes in Asia. Communism was just their excuse. And it was pretty much the same story in the Philippines with a crooked politician the Mafia levered into power called Ferdinand Marcos. As for the United States, Big Brother Sam explained that the Fat Cats were fully aware that Americans will do anything for patriotism. Hence, you must always provide them with an enemy, a boogeyman. They won't overwork themselves just to make huge profits for fat cats, for any other reason. So new enemies had to be found or created. This is what Joe McCarthy's Reds Under the Bed Scare had really been all about. And they used the same excuse in Laos, Chile, Guatemala, El Salvador, Iran, Honduras, Vietnam and Cuba. If a small country refused to go along with American business interests, which basically meant with the rights of Western multinationals to pay slave wages, to third world peasant farmers growing commodities like tobacco or sugar or fruit, they simply labelled them as communist, assassinated the democratically elected head of state with teams recruited from their secret societies, the Central Intelligence Agency and the Mafia, and put in a man favourable to their interests, as with the Shah in Iran. Simple. And even more to this, Giancana explained to his brother that the political game at home had to be played in the same way as the phony war game abroad. The lesson was that a businessman always protects his interests by playing both sides. Sam Giancana knew that the Second World War had been exactly the same as all the CIA's covert wars during the 1950s. They were conducted in order to make more money for the super rich. Because in every case they were selling weapons and fuel to both sides just as they had the Germans. On the American mainland this cynical attitude manifests itself in the way the gangsters supported the campaigns of both leading candidates in every political head-to-head, in order to make sure that whoever got elected, he was always their man and on their side. 
So this was the real political world, which the young Senator John F. Kennedy became a part of in 1950s America. It was a world ruled by a super-rich cabal of secret Nazis who had built the fascist war machine and concentration camps purely to protect themselves and their money from socialist Russia. Having avoided prosecution for the greatest crime in human history, they were confident that they could kill anyone and get away with it, particularly if it was someone who might interfere with their power to instigate phony wars in order to make huge fortunes by lending money and selling weapons to both sides. The war in which he himself had bravely fought was a sham and even John F. Kennedy did not understand this. Or perhaps we should say that he didn't fully understand what was going on. He and his younger brother Bobby were certainly all too keenly aware of the extent to which their country was in the grip of organised crime because their own father, the patriarch Joseph P. Kennedy, had made his personal fortune from running illegal liquor during the days of Prohibition, activities which earned him the nickname Bootlegger Joe. Experienced people are aware that the tendency of each new generation to reject the ideas of the previous generation is an abiding characteristic in human affairs, and it is perfectly plain that with Jack and Bobby it had the effect of making both men highly principled. Their own father had associated with crooks and gangsters, and it was quite clear from their style and their outlook that they had made a commitment to make up for the sins of their father by rejecting this sinister world of hoods and crooks and corrupt politicians, by being honest and decent. If you take a look at any group photo from the early days, it's clear these men are being determinedly clean-cut, with the accent heavily on the clean part. They knew their father's generation were dirty. It couldn't be more obvious that they were determined to be the opposite. The question was, how were they going to free themselves and their country from the entanglements of the crooked politicians and the psychopathic mafia dons who together were controlling the whole of American life like some multi-legged fascist octopus? How they were going to pull this off was something they were discussing ad nauseam when in the late 1950s they found out their father was in big trouble. A contract had been taken out on Joe Kennedy's life by the Purple Gang, the Jewish Mafia of New York, who had accused him of swindling them out of a fortune. Joe Kennedy was really scared, and he turned for help toward the one man in North America who he knew had the power to get the contract called off, Sam Giancana. Giancana had done business with Kennedy for years, so he agreed to help, but he wanted something for it. He was all too aware of Joe's political ambitions for his son and of JFK's outstanding good looks. He wanted assurances that if Jack one day made it to the White House, Joe Kennedy would see to it that the heat the two brothers had been trying to turn up on the Mafia would be turned down. And, according to Chuck and Sam Giancana Jr., Joseph B. Kennedy, just to save his own skin, agreed. Can you tell us anything about any of your operations? Or you just... Uh, like giggle every time I ask you a question. The client adds because I honestly believe my answer might tend to incriminate me. I thought only little girls giggled with the gene Connor. <laughs> In this way, a very confused situation was created because Sam Giancana, the very kind of mob boss whom the Kennedys had been fighting so hard through the McClellan Committee to put in jail, now thought that they should and would be grateful to him. It was this expectation and this misunderstanding which now led Giancana to try to draw the Kennedys more and more into his dark world, something which he appeared to be succeeding with in the way that first Peter Lawford and then Frank Sinatra established relationships with both men. Lawford married Kennedy's sister. Everyone is voting for Jack. Sinatra was putting together campaigning jingles, and it must have seemed to many insiders at the time that when Sam Giancana went around boasting that, as usual, he had everything under control, and that when Jack got to the White House it was going to be a dream ticket for the Mafia, that it must all be true. His boys appeared to be partying together. And those who were in the know were aware that JFK had at least some sort of relationship with Judith Campbell Exner, Sam Giancana's girlfriend. What we haven't known until now is that JFK was hoodwinking Giancana all along. 
The role that Judy Campbell played was mostly that of a go-between. What Kennedy was doing through her was giving Giancana FBI reports on mob bosses to make him think that law enforcement were not all that well informed about the Mafia scams and their movements, nor even terribly interested. What Giancana did not know was that the FBI reports he was receiving were carefully selected and most definitely incomplete. Kennedy was not helping Giancana. He was not keeping him in the picture. What he was doing was pulling the wool over his eyes. For the first time in his life, Sam Giancana was perplexed, and he became more confused when there was a sudden freezing over of relations. JFK abruptly ended his relationship with Sinatra, and Judy Campbell suddenly found the White House were refusing her calls. Even more to this, Giancana's limitations were shown up in the way he completely failed to comprehend that Kennedy truly was decent and honest. He apparently had many conversations with Murray the Camel Humphreys around this time, in which both were reassuring each other that Kennedy's white knight lifestyle was just a political game to make him look good. Quite clearly, this cynical outlook was the product of living in their dark and corrupt world. They had never known an honest and decent man, because in the Mafia, there's no such thing. There is no record of what was said during the three meetings which JFK had with Giancana and his father at the Fontainebleau Hotel just prior to the 1960 general election. But it does now seem that in this most titanic battle of wits between the craftiest criminal in America and the most brilliant politician the world had ever seen, Kennedy had won. He had played the Mafia at their own game and played it better. Why did John F. Kennedy do this? Because... He must have known just what a dangerous game he was playing. There certainly appears to be no doubt, now that we ourselves are aware of the all-pervading influence of organised crime in America at that time, that this brave and decent and honest man had realised that he could never get rid of the Mafia and their dirty fascist friends in politics, industry and banking without first enlisting their help. He had to trick them. And with this new understanding, we can now see, for the first time, with the correct perspective, the motives, characters, intrigues and diverse political interests which were gathering against President Kennedy when he took the oath of office. Organised crime were fearful of JFK before he ascended to power because the shrewdest amongst them were getting a sense that he had outfoxed and outmaneuvered the all-powerful Mafia bosses. But the big mistake researchers have made in the past has been to not understand that every American oligarch, the big oil men, the captains of industry, the merchant bankers, the intelligence chiefs, were all crooks and gangsters as well. The biggest crook in the land was the head of law enforcement, J. Edgar Hoover. This is what historians have failed to understand until now. When JFK appointed his 32-year-old kid brother to the post of Attorney General, these people collectively froze. It now fully hit home that JFK really was honest and decent. It hit home that he wanted to make his country as honest and decent as he was, and that he actually believed that with the help of his energetic and determined crime-busting brother, that he could do it. His attitude, of course, stood in marked contrast to the man whom Kennedy was saddled with as his running mate. Anyone who has any doubts about the moral rectitude of the average American politician of that time has only to look at the career of Lyndon Baines Johnson to see that, generally speaking, they were worse than the Mafia itself. From his involvement with the Box 13 scandal and through all of his dealings with his crooked Texan business associate, Billy Solestes, LBJ proved again and again that he was every bit as unscrupulous as any mob boss and willing to do absolutely anything for power. This was a man who'd had his own sister, Josepha, murdered by his personal hitman, a highly intelligent and psychopathic killer named Malcolm Wallace, who later shot dead the golf professional, John Douglas Kinzer. When this case came to court, it revealed to the American public how totally corrupt the justice system had become, because LBJ was able to get Wallace off with a five-year suspended sentence. Found guilty of murder one, he walked free that very day, this was the sort of corruption which was running rife through the American political system when Fidel Castro overthrew the right-wing government of Fulgencio Bantista in 1959. Few people are aware that by this advanced stage in their relationship, the CIA and the Mafia were together employing the Giancana tactic of supporting both sides in a war. 
For many years beforehand, they had been supporting Castro, and not just the Batista regime, as many think, by smuggling in both arms and mercenaries to aid the peasant farmers. One of these mercenaries, an Italian-American called Frank Fiorini, later came to play a pivotal role both in the assassination and subsequent cover-up under his assumed name, Frank Sturgis. Sturgis and Castro were photographed together many times during the Cuban Revolution. But after Castro enlisted the help of the Russian Soviets, Sturgis turned against him. Like many in the CIA mafia network, he felt double-crossed when Castro closed the island's casinos and nationalised all Cuban business. He therefore joined forces with men like Bernard Barker, Batista's former secret police chief, and other Cuban expats who had fled en masse to Miami, Florida, and who now sat together on the American mainland as a very disgruntled and highly politicised splinter group. Of course, to the American Nazis, who had bankrolled Hitler, this was intolerable. It was a commercial disaster. Coca-Cola had made millions in easy profits using dirt-cheap Cuban sugar grown by dirt-poor Cuban peasants. They were now being told by an upstart third-world dictator that they would have to pay for sugar at the normal market rate. And the mafia were losing millions every single day from the loss of illegal gambling. America's Nazi shadow government therefore decided that someone was going to have to mould this loosely knit group of disgruntled anti-Castro Cubans into a crack invasion force to retake the island. Having put their heads together, Dulles and Harriman and Richard Bissell decided this would be an excellent job for Prescott's eldest son, George Herbert Walker Bush, a chance for him to prove himself, along with one of his Texas oil business associates, Jack Alston Crichton. Together, these two recruited and trained the Cubans for several terrorist groups known as Operation 40, Alpha 66, ZR Rifle, and Operation Mongoose. Renegade bands of merciless assassins who would kill Castro and who could later be counted on to eliminate any other third world leaders who dared to interfere with American commercial interests. It was this diverse and unsavoury stream of political intrigue which produced President Kennedy's first great political crisis, the Bay of Pigs, in 1962. By this time, JFK was well aware that the CIA was something much more like a private firm or a family. He wasn't surprised when they invaded Cuba without his permission because he knew they were totally out of control. His antipathy led him to cancel the promised air support and inevitably the invasion failed. The anti-Castro Cubans were mostly captured and Kennedy then tried to add insult to injury by ordering J. Edgar Hoover's FBI to close down the camps where the Cubans were trained. He even allowed Khrushchev, the Soviet leader, to inspect the camps to see they were closed so this could never happen again. Having only just escaped with his life at the Bay of Pigs, it was pretty clear that Frank Sturgis was more than a little annoyed. He was scared because Khrushchev says, don't do this or we're going to do that. You know, so he didn't do it and he deserted the Bay of Pigs. I was involved in the Bay of Pigs. A lot of people, friends of mine, that were killed in the Bay of Pigs. And I resent that. Don't play political games with me. I'm a military man. I'm a soldier. I go fight. But damn it, if I risk my ass out there and I'm getting shot at, I don't want some stupid ass politician to go ahead and make deals behind my back where my people or maybe myself are going to get killed. I don't like that. This then is how the stage was set for the Kennedy assassination. And when one remembers the colossal number of ruthless and hideously brutal men who had created this situation, it's perhaps a little ironic that a peripheral figure in the cast of characters who actually put the plot together was an attractive young woman. 19-year-old Marita Lorenz's love affair with Fidel Castro and her subsequent recruitment as a CIA assassin by Frank Sturgis to kill him is a very well-known story because it was made into a feature film. In spite of her failure to kill the Cuban leader, Lorenz continued to associate with the assassination squads trained by the CIA, and it was largely her testimony in the Spotlight magazine trial after a skilful cross-examination by Mark Lane, which gave us a window through which we can now see who really participated in the Kennedy assassination and who was really behind it all. First of all, 
After the Bay of Pigs invasion, Kennedy had fired Alan Dulles, Richard Bissell and General Charles Cable for essentially using the CIA as their personal hit men. After he found out that Robert Mayhew had sought Sam Giancana's permission to talk to his underboss, John Roselli, about the possibility of a hit on Fidel Castro. Here you have a government agency, funded by the American taxpayer, associating with the very organised crime racketeers JFK was trying to put in jail, for the purpose of carrying out political murders. The president was incensed. Historians have never been surprised that he vowed to smash the CIA into a thousand pieces. It hardly takes a genius to see why the CIA wanted to kill him. What is more, Jack Alston Crichton and the lifelong friends of Alan Dulles, the Bush family, had just recently purchased exclusive access to 15 million acres of Cuba, almost half the entire island, in order to drill for oil. When he came to power, Castro reduced this to a mere 20,000 acres, a colossal investment which now failed and which led to Crichton's CVOVT oil exploration company being delisted from the stock exchange at a loss of $30 million. Crichton and George Bush's friends, the Texas oil billionaires, Clint Murchison and Haroldson Lafayette Hunt, also knew that Kennedy wanted to end their most vital tax break, the oil depletion allowance. And their bosom buddy, Vice President Lyndon Johnson, was standing at this time with one foot in jail and the other on a banana skin due to his involvement in the corruption scandal now breaking around his favourite assistant, Bobby Baker. LBJ knew his life was finished if Kennedy lived, and he would become president himself if Kennedy died. So his involvement in the plot is hardly difficult to understand. And even more to this, the heads both of the US military and the military-industrial complex which supplied them, exactly the same Nazis who had supported Hitler in World War II, were fully aware that Kennedy wanted to pull out of Vietnam in a move which would have eventually cost them billions in lost weapon sales. This circle of thugs and pirates was completed by LBJ's next-door neighbour, J. Edgar Hoover, who had himself invested millions in Clint Murchison's oil business, just like his Mafia associate, Vito Genovese. Stepping back to look upon this rogues gallery, it really is remarkable how Kennedy had managed to make an enemy out of every single dirty hood, every corrupt politician and every single Nazi businessman living in the country at that time. It is highly misleading even to see these groups as separate because the truth is that they were all brutal fascists who saw nothing wrong in killing to get their own way. The question now was, how were they going to get him? Because we must never forget that generals, admirals, mafia dons, intelligence chiefs, corrupt politicians and oil billionaires are only people. None of them wanted to go to the electric chair for conspiracy to murder the president. They knew that they had to put together a plan which could not fail to both kill Kennedy and then cover up afterwards the fact that they did it. They knew that in men like Frank Sturgis, his Cuban assassination squads, and the Mafia hitmen working with the CIA, they had a huge pool of killers to choose from who were ready, able and willing to do the deed. All the same, how could they possibly get to Kennedy? Because they knew that, at least in Washington, all American presidents are extremely well protected by the Secret Service. The most important first step was to engage the age-old mafia tactic of finding a patsy. To this end, they turned to George de Morenschild, a very sophisticated exiled Russian count and CIA agent, who was close friends in the old business with George Bush and the Texas oil men. They were aware that they needed someone like Giuseppe Zangara, who appeared to be a low-life, discontented misfit. So they chose a low-level CIA operative, who had been groomed precisely in order to appear to be a low-life, discontented misfit, and Ali Harvey Oswald, who was carefully handled by de Morinchild as he was placed like a chess piece in the Texas School Book Depository. With the patsy selected, the combined heads of the American Nazis now sat down together to discuss their problem. How do you kill a man? 
riding in an open car on a public street in front of hordes of people without being seen. And then, how do you cover up forever afterwards the fact that this was a conspiracy and not the work of a lone nut? The plotters were keenly aware that it was the second question which posed the biggest problem. The professional military men like Colonel Ed Lansdale and Admiral George Berkeley, Kennedy's personal physician, were well aware that there are any number of ways to hide or disguise a sniper behind trees, inside other vehicles, behind windows in office buildings. But this was a plot which had to have an absolute guarantee of success. If a squad of riflemen were all to fire at their target at the same time, this would certainly guarantee the man's death. But the subsequent police investigation would instantly realise more than one shooter was involved. A team of gunmen all firing together might actually blow Kennedy's head clean off. A single sniper couldn't do that. So what were they to do? It was during these deliberations that a macabre thought first registered. They would have to control the body after the shooting in order to make sure that all physical evidence available to police forensic scientists conform to the scenario of a single assassin. And just how in the hell were they going to do that? By way of preparing the ground, Sam Giancana now ordered Richard Nixon's political associate Jack Ruby to keep Oswald snug under his wing, and then to set about hiring the best local riflemen, preferred candidates being men like his close friend Charles Void Harrelson, the father of Hollywood actor Woody Harrelson, who had proven his hitman credentials by shooting dead dozens of men for money. He then turned to his mafia associates, Carlos Marcello and Santos Traficante, to supply the best gunmen from their cities while he himself instructed the well-known underboss Tony Accardo to give the Chicago end of the contract to Giancarlo's favourite and most trusted hoodlums, Charles Nicoletti and Milwaukee Phil Aldericio. This pair had to be flown in 1,500 miles to the ranch of Mafia Hood, Peter Lacavale, and then driven the remaining 600 miles to Dallas. It had been agreed with Giancarna's and Genovese's oil business partners, H.L. Hunt and Clint Murchison, that every gunman would be paid $50,000 for the hit, and that the oil men would stump up the cash so there was no way of tracing it back to either the mob or the CIA. For their part, Jack Crichton and George Bush were trying to lay the groundwork at the street level with the mayor, Earl Cable, the brother of CIA chief Charles Cable, whom Kennedy had fired. Both the Cable brothers were crucially important in the development of the fine details of the plot, because they agreed to allow Crichton and his associates, George Lumpkin, the Dallas police chief, Lieutenant Colonel George Whitmire and Harry Weatherford to make use of their 488th Military Intelligence Detachment, a privately funded part-time intelligence force which had amongst its ranks many members of the John Birch Society, the Ku Klux Klan and around half of all the serving police officers in Dallas. The plotters realised this was a masterstroke because it meant they could control the streets and the crime scene, but they also realised that when the shooting occurred, the response of at least half the police on duty would appear to be completely genuine. And yet for all this intricate planning, involving, as Sam Giancana later admitted, dozens of men, the American Nazis were aware they still had a problem. Getting the snipers into position and coordinating their fire by radio was not too difficult. It's something the military do every day. But this problem of blowing the man's head clean off had another side to it. Supposing, as can happen, all the snipers missed. How could they possibly legislate for this contingency? You see, being a professional sniper is a lot like being a professional golfer. Everyone knows that, generally speaking, a golf pro on a par 3 will hit the green. But even the world's best occasionally miss by a wide margin, and the same can happen to any rifleman. We can be quite certain that the guiding brains of the American Nazis, Alan Dulles and David Attlee Phillips, in order to cover this eventuality, must have at least considered having one assassin run up to the limousine to attempt a point-blank range mafia-style shooting should the others miss. 
But then another problem appeared. Supposing their assassin couldn't run quick enough to jump on a speeding car. Little by little, the realisation hit home. The plot could even wind up looking silly and themselves ridiculous. There was only one answer. They would have to control the President's protection, the Secret Service. Marita Lorenz testified, under oath, that in late November of 1963 she drove from Miami to Dallas, Texas with Frank Sturgis, followed by a backup car which contained a stash of weapons. Travelling along with them were Jerry Patrick Hemming, an American mercenary like Sturgis. Were you ever offered money to assassinate President Kennedy? Directly, on numerous occasions. Two Cuban brothers, Ignacio and Guillermo Novo Sampol, a Cuban pilot called Pedro Diaz Lanz, and his friend Orlando Bosch. At first, Marita assumed this was to be just another arms smuggling engagement, just like many others she'd been on with Sturgis before. However, when they reached their Dallas motel, they were visited by someone Marita had met many times before, CIA agent E. Howard Hunt, who stayed almost an hour and paid Sturgis with cash stuffed in a very large envelope. This was the evening of November 21st, 1963, and Marita began to get worried. She knew that President Kennedy was visiting Dallas the next day. Becoming concerned, she pressed Sturgis as to the real purpose of the visit, and when he told her that for this one time it had to be confidential, she decided she wanted out. Marita had no way of knowing that a great number of other people had made similar journeys that day. CIA pilot Tosh Plumley flew several assassins into Dallas Love Field without even being told who they were. From all over the country, radio operators, riflemen, drivers, false ID suppliers like Chauncey Holt and Bernard Barker, and getaway pilots like David Ferry, converged on the city. Whilst at the home of oil man Clint Murchison, a group of his Nazi friends were congregating to celebrate Kennedy's imminent demise. Due to the testimony of LBJ's mistress, Madeleine Duncan Brown, the mother of his illegitimate son, we now know that amongst these guests were J. Edgar Hoover and his homosexual lover, Clyde Tolson, who stood to lose the millions they'd invested in their host's oil business if Kennedy lived. Hoover also knew Kennedy wanted to replace him as head of the FBI the two Brown brothers of Brown Brothers Harriman, who along with Cliff Carter, John Connolly, and Senator Joseph Yarborough, stood to lose millions from lost defense contracts because they knew JFK wanted to end the Vietnam War. Also present were Joseph Sevilla, head of the mafia in Dallas, and the mayor of Dallas, Earl Cable, the CIA men who knew the president